Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We are always thrilled to see people joining these webinars from all over North America and the world. So first of all, thank you for continuing to support McMaster, DeGroote, and our programming. We have two special guests here with us tonight for this exciting discussion. Our first guest who I'd like to introduce is a DeGroote alumnus, Sean Chung. Sean is the founder and CEO of Raising the Village, an organization serving last mile communities in Uganda's remote areas by helping them move out of ultra poverty. Serving as a catalyst for public and civic action, the organization leverages village partnerships by using existing household resources and a small one-time investment to increase household incomes and broaden civic engagement. Raising the Village partners with over 65,000 new beneficiaries each year, seeing families break out of extreme poverty within 24 months. Sean is passionate about creating opportunities and space for families marginalized by time and place to achieve these goals. And let me just say that I've met Sean personally. We've discussed this. I've had 25 years experience working in the African continent. And I have to say, Sean is a remarkable individual, very open to learning, very open to new perspectives, and is really doing stellar work on the continent. Prior to founding Raising the Village, Sean held a management consultant's role with Accenture advising clients in financial, logistics, and public sectors. And, you know, I have to add that this is the kind of job that our graduates typically dream about. They get jobs as consultants and then either hope to become partners or use their, their positions to leverage a better position in a corporate environment where they move up the corporate hierarchy. Sean did something very unusual. And that is he chose instead to go to develop a, a master's in public administration, MPA, from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, which is arguably the best place in the world to study those issues. So from Harvard, Sean received the McMaster Arch Award in 2012, and he's one of the 2020 honorees for Canada's top 40 under 40. So he really is an exceptional person. And uh, I will add also that Sean has been very generous with his time at Mac. He has shared his experience with our integrated business and humanity students. Um, he's even shared data and our fourth year students now are busy working, trying to understand the quantitative fundamentals of the organization, of how he's prospered, how we solved those problems. And that's providing our fourth year students with exceptional entry into the world of international development. Sean will be joined by McMaster alumni, Alyssa Lai, who'll be our discussion facilitator for this evening. Alyssa is a cross-sectoral communications professional who worked in nonprofit, public, and private sectors to lead end-to-end -end communication strategy and planning. Working for a leading national insurance and financial services organization, Alyssa creates and oversees internal communication strategies for key organizational priorities. As a former Civic Action Diversity Fellow, she strives to create and make space for new voices to exercise leadership. Since arriving in Canada in 2008, Alyssa has worked and volunteered for more than 15 nonprofits, including environment, social services, and literacy organization. She chaired one of Ontario's largest young professional networks, Hamilton High. Alyssa was awarded the YWCA Hamilton Women of Distinction in Public Affairs and McMaster's Hamilton Community Impact, a testament of her love for the city she now calls home. Thank you both for being here today, and we look forward to hearing your insights on today's topic. Alyssa, I will now hand it over to you. Hello, and welcome to this At Home with Mac event, where we'll be talking about creating change for the better. 
My name is Elisa Lai, and I'm a corporate communications professional for a National Financial Services Cooperative. It is my pleasure to be the host and facilitator for tonight's conversation. I first started working in the nonprofit sector where values such as equity, inclusion, and social justice were instilled in my DNA. That is why I'm excited to have this conversation tonight with Sean Holden Chung, the founder and CEO of Raising the Village, a nonprofit that works with communities in Uganda to provide critical infrastructure, tools, and training in remote areas of the country. The overarching goal of Raising the Village is to end ultra poverty in Uganda. Sean is also one of Canada's top 40 out of 40, which celebrates the very best of Canada's present and future leaders. Thank you, Sean, for spending time with us today. Thanks we've received me. we've received many questions from you in advance of tonight's conversation, and we've incorporated them in our discussion today. That said, if you have additional questions as we go along, feel free to add them in the Q and A feature. We'll be addressing them as time permits. Now, Sean, let's get to how it all first began. You graduated from a master's degree school of business and then worked in management consultant for a bit at Accenture. Not many would expect a pivot to launch a global nonprofit. Can you share with us how the concept of raising the village was born and how do you get it off the ground? Sure, um, you know, before I, before I jumped into management consulting, I had, had quite a bit of time uh, between the time of my graduation and, and the time that that was going to start. And so I decided to take the time to get some different perspectives of what was going on in the world. And so decided to sign up and, and work alongside a microfinance, uh, grassroots local microfinance organization in Uganda. So went over there to work alongside them, doing consulting as well as have an opportunity to engage and discuss with communities in these last mile and remote areas, you know, what were their challenges and what were the key barriers that were uh, affecting them? And, and what the feedback was consistent was that they had a lot of great ideas. They knew exactly where they wanted to go, but they just need someone to show them how or to enable them to unlock them. And so there was a number of barriers that were affecting them and, and uh, they were faced with these challenges, um, but they just didn't have the outlook. And so mm -hmm. when, I, when I went back uh, and joined management consulting, you know, that was my J job. <laughs> I did that from an eight to eight. And, and every night from nine to two, uh, I did research. And so uh, what I did is I, I went to understand different development models, the trending, as well as, you know, I started to come up with things, uh, different models that might work to reach these remote and rural areas uh, and specifically to uh, engage the ultra poor. And so from there, once, uh, once I felt there was a, a worthwhile model to uh, engage and, and trial, you know, this is something that I uh, piloted uh, with my own savings that I had been earning and, and went out there and worked with them, discussed with the community if there's something that they want to do. And, and we continue to do that uh, with a small team uh, and, and over a, a few years. And this continued to be my night job uh, until it got to a size where it was a bit too big and, and uh, I decided to make that leap. What was the biggest challenge in starting something like this and how do you even tackle it? You know, I, I think there's a lot of challenges when you're when you're starting up an organization, uh, let alone one uh, that is, um, you know, from from uh, Toronto is is in a different time zone and halfway around the world, and a lot of that is is cultural. I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. cultural differences, but also being able to balance um, a lot of the learning that you need to engage with any startup or any business, and so you know, some of those setbacks are are uh, a part of it, but and when you're working in last mile in these remote areas, that means the connectivity is very poor. When we first started mm -hmm. out, um, you know, things like email, you know, it was an entire day to send a single email out. Uh, and so you had to really dedicate that time. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate to have uh, bosses that were uh, supportive of me taking, you know, eight months off at a time to go out and, and do this work. Now, when people hear Uganda, they, they have a certain picture in mind. What are some of the misconceptions about Uganda that you now know of? And how have you worked to challenge those misconceptions? Yeah, you know, I think that 
I think that often uh, the narratives that we, we see in, in the media might be a little bit surface level or you might get the flash highlights. Um, and until you get a chance to be on the ground and, and engage, I think I think what you start to see is is a different side to the content that might be, you know, more than just the salary or, or uh, you know, some of the, the uh, drama you see, uh, you know, uh, let's say a military crew of the sort. But you'll find the people that are very entrepreneurial, they're very hardworking, um, uh, and incredibly bright. And, and so they just have all of these uh, abilities and this willingness to do so much. Uh, as well as a, a strong and tight knit community that that leads for a different way in, uh, of how that society operates and and how we can do development. Mm -hmm. Well, your comment rem reminded me of a service learning trip that I did when I was a student at Mac to Peru, and and like you, I knew nothing about Peru back then, but. Also, like you, I discover a lot of the richness and resiliency of the community. And I wonder, how have you seen some of those richness and resiliency come through your work as you spend your time there and be immersed in those communities? You know, it, it's interesting when, uh, when we have those, when we do these programs, you know, the communities that we work with range from 500 to, you know, 1,500 folks. Mm -hmm. and they'll come together and they will, uh, we'll bring them together to a community-wide discussion, you know, certainly those focus groups. But uh, just the level of cooperation that you're willing, they're willing to put in and, and do together. So uh, having community members that decide uh, as a whole that they need to see uh, roads into their village uh, as, as a, a driver of economy and an opportunity. And to see people come in, every household at least dedicating one person two times a week to dig. And, and we're not talking, uh, you know, a small road, we're talking about you know, 10, 20 kilometers uh, and digging it out of the side of a mountain and to make sure that they've got that. And, and that's a level of cooperation and, and a willingness to, to stick in that is, um, you know, is something that I find is quite unique to the space. Absolutely. And I think the more we challenge ourselves, uh, with all these um, misconceptions that we see out there and move past all of that in order to understand the heart of the matter and realize that we're working with people who are ultimately driven towards making their communities a better place, the better we are to work together in that regard. Now, I want to get into the topic of poverty because there is a misconception that poverty is a result of a person's own failure and the lack of motivation to lift themselves out of that dire situation. How do you persuade those with wealth and resources to look beyond poverty as a moral failure, but more of a systemic problem? It's interesting, you know, um, you know, a lot of the folks that we operate with and, and, and a lot of the philanthropic organizations we have, um, you know, when I've engaged with individuals, the only people I feel uh, I find are comfortable with, or, or not maybe comfortable, but are familiar with, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen on, uh, not bothered with having holes in their clothing are, are those that aren't able to afford it and, and those that are billionaires. And, and so when we have this conversation, this is a natural realization of, of time and place and having, um, and having the, just recognizing that just because of circumstance, where you were born, what opportunities were provided. Uh, and and that, that seems to be, that seems to strike, especially those, those groups of people that I engage with. And, and there's a willingness and a generosity that exists. And so there is, I think, with that recognition uh, that um, in many ways that we're lucky and, and mm -hmm. fortunate to be in this situation, I, I don't think is lost. Mm -hmm. And, well, I didn't give you this question in advance, but <laughs> um, more so as, I was, as you were talking, I was wondering, as you have conversations with donors, funders, or anybody who may not know what Raising the Village does, and when you come to them with this approach, what was their initial reaction and thought process around it? And 
what is the sentiment? I think it's a it's a different way because it uh, it addresses I think two different mainly two different perspectives on the work, and the first one is really an introduction on behavioral science. It's to mm -hmm. understand that um, you know we've made a lot of great advancements. I think some of the research that Kahneman has done or Molithinen has done has really demonstrated you know that we've got a finite number of decisions. Uh, we only have a certain bandwidth. And so uh, we have this philosophy that says if we're hungry, thirsty, or not feeling well, it doesn't matter if someone mm -hmm. shows up to the training, you're just not going to be able to pick it up. And so right. if we can uh, eliminate a lot of those barriers uh, in the way that we address a program, we're going to be able to get a higher percentage of people participating as well as people retaining that knowledge. And so that really builds that foundation of creating the bandwidth and uh, time and space. I, I would argue that the, the resource that the, is most scarce for the ultra poor is time. And mm. the time to actually have the availability to make decisions uh, and, and to think more than just of the day. Uh, I think the other, the other component would be the, our work with the government. I think the, mm -hmm. there's a narrative out there that says that, you know, uh, African governments uh, have high levels of graft, there's corruption, and, and and that, you know, it's a very challenging environment. I think, I think the work that we do in Uganda has demonstrated the effectiveness of how the government can operate when they're just given, you know, some pieces mm -hmm. of leverage. And so what we've identified in, in our conversations and dialogue uh, with the local government is to say, how can we better support your development plans or the way that you see your communities developing? And then very often they'll have a very clear plan, but uh, we'll say, well, what's the limitation to this? And, and mm -hmm. the limitation would be something like fuel, not having enough fuel to conduct the trainings in a number of places. And so, you know, the fuel for a motorbike might be one to two dollars. And being able to leverage the expertise of someone that lives locally, has been in that community, and has all of the training uh, mm -hmm. is a long way to ensure that we have a sustainable way of development. I love your example there about a misconception about other governments in other countries and also goes to show that something like this, raising the village, literally takes a village. It requires partners of all dimensions and all different areas. Um, I want to touch on the topic of mental health. We just had Bell Let's Talk Day last week and in Canada or rather in North America, conversations about mental health isn't new. But when we were discussing about the topic of mental health and we were trying to frame this conversation, you framed mental health as mental capacity, which I thought was an interesting way of looking at it in a different dimension um, based on your observations and issues you see in Uganda. If so, how do issues about mental capacity manifest itself in Uganda? And to what extent do you see those issues relate to poverty? Yeah, it, it, you know, it's interesting. When we talk about the um, limitations of time and the scarcity of time, you know, we all struggle with it to some degree, and it's stressful. You know, when we do our work with the, the Ministry of Health and, and doing a lot of diagnosis, especially with folks that uh, communities in these rural areas, uh, they live, you know, they walk all day, they, um, you know, they do a quite a, they're quite active. But one of the highest risks we have is stress-related diseases, so things around hypertension, around um, diabetes, and it, and and it's and and it has this effect uh, where because you're limited in your capacities that you're able to, um, you know, you're able to you know uh, operate on a normal kind of functioning uh, basis. And so what we see, see is that there's actually a lot of um, stress-related. Um, uh, outcomes around, you know, alcoholism, as well as uh, higher levels of GBV, uh, which is something that we always need to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, but certainly it is, what we find is that when we're able to reduce those stress levels, especially within the household, we see significant drops in, in, in these types of issues. And on the topic of mental health, your own mental health um, in general, how do you avoid getting emotionally invested in the problems that you engage with and to the point where you can't let it go? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's an issue that, you know, when you're in the development space, whether you're in the humanitarian uh, space or you're in, um, you know, the, with, with the relief as well as development, I think there's a level of, um, a, low, uh, a level of um, trauma that comes with that work. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that that's something that we're starting to realize as an industry, as a sector, is something we need to address and have that dialogue. I think that um, recognize the boundaries of what we can do as well as uh, being able to have the support within the system and, and, and what that impact does for all of us is important. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine through that journey of working with different people and working with different communities, um, you may have encountered some of your own blind spots, perhaps, um, that you now realize that you have and you're working to um, unveil a lot of that. So what are some insightful ways that you could share as advice on how we as individuals could look at our own blind spots and address them when it comes to issues of equity, equality, and inclusion? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And, and recognizing you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. is a good place to start. I think that, um, you know, giving the room and the space for conversation and dialogue. So a lot of our engagements, when we go right into the village, uh, and, and, and including myself, as even with our team in Uganda, uh, is, is to let, let the community lead and in deciding, you know, where they see the best way forward. And so uh, that starts with that dialogue and that conversation. Mm -hmm. If you, many times when you go into a community and just the way the cultural system works, if, if it's just a 500 people in a, in a place, it, it means that only the men will speak. Well, how do you create that environment where mm -hmm. it's safe for women to speak or for youth to speak or, or the vulnerable families within a community? Even though we might classify a community as ultra poor, there's varying levels of poverty within that community. Very often the poorest in that community mm -hmm. are embarrassed to even come to that town center or that village center for a discussion. So creating that safe space, space for that conversation as well as giving room for the projects and the initiatives to allow for participation um, within the cultural structure, I think is important. If you just come in and say, you know, this is the structure of this project, you know, this is how it's going to run, these are the people that are going to fit into it, you're going to get participation, but you're not going to get the ownership or the, um, the range of participants that you're really looking for. And, and so you want to create those avenues that are both accepted by the existing structures of leadership, but also gives room and space. And so we spend a lot of time uh, up front, you know, before we even launch any program, having those dialogues so that everybody's on the same page about it. I, I picked up on a nuance that you have there where you say you spend a lot of time up front having those dialogues because oftentimes, I think when people go into a certain project, they may be in a taskmaster mode where they just want to do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. But your experiences have taught you that, well, hold a task, let's focus on building relationships for the better first. Yeah, that's right. And, and it starts right at the government level. And so before you enter a, a district or a country, a district uh, or a specific village, it's making sure that um, we're not coming in up and announced, we're not just showing up and on our motorbikes and, and, and starting to have these conversations, but there's a level of introduction. And so that, you know, from the beginning, you know, whether, uh, whether we're having that initial meeting at that government space is that we've got someone that's vouching for us or having that conversation at a village level to say, this is raising the village, this is why they're coming in, and then having our own conversations to explain, you know, what the purpose is and and what the goals are about you know, supporting them and their priorities. And so with that space, you know, before our program implementation takes about six months, but before that, we've got about two to three months of conversation mm -hmm. to make sure that our officers are in the field, meeting, going door to door, making sure they know the people and the faces and, and getting a sense of, you know, uh, of who's there and where's the need as well as you know, uh, maybe a little bit of town gossip along the way. <laughs> Now, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, and we chatted earlier, and you mentioned to me that you have about 80 staff. 
and only about five of them here in Toronto and 75 of them are abroad um, in Uganda. And if so, how has the pandemic, first of all, changed the way you work, you and your colleagues work, and also changed the way you think about the kind of work that you do? Yeah, you know, I think, I think like much of the world, uh, when, when the pandemic hit, um, we had to accelerate a lot of the programs that we were already underway because uh, even though we were already operating remotely, we had technology. It meant that we needed to kind of double down on what we were doing because simply we weren't able to travel on the ground as much with some of the restrictions, as well as uh, our team in Canada, you know, uh, wasn't able to travel uh, and still aren't able to travel. And so one of the challenges that, that uh, came with this is uh, even though in U Uganda there was a lockdown, about uh, a week into the lockdown, you know, we received a call from the government to say, "No, we need you in the field." Uh, so you, you're a, you're a, you're an essential service, and you need to get going. And so that meant that we needed to adapt quickly to to that new working environment. Certainly with the PPE and the way that we we arrange for groups, but uh, and, and arrange our network of community, but also the way that we think about um, the way that we monitor, the way that we measure, and the way that we track progress. And so how do we streamline those things to make everything as uh, touch-free, especially within a development context where um, you know, access to power is limited, access to the internet is limited. Um, it just meant that we, we needed to change a lot of, uh, of what, it, what it means to work in a, um, very distributed, decentralized model uh, of development. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go around to some of the few questions that we got from the audience in advance. Um, one of the things that came up is the question on how how have you applied, learn applied and learned your experiences to develop solutions to such complex issues. Um, I'm thinking about your experiences at the Groot and even in Accenture. How do you went from there to there and apply some of that key learning there into work that you do right now? Right. You know, it's, I think, you know, what you bring a lot of the time is, um, you know, and I wouldn't consider myself the doer itself. I would consider myself actually more of the coach. And, mm -hmm. and, and so... Uh, with consulting and, and, and with, the, with the education that you get in university, it's all about frameworks and structure. How do you structure a problem? And how can you uh, deconstruct it? And so uh, as a consultant, a management consultant, you can imagine um, you're consulting quite a bit. Uh, and so you might not actually have very much technical knowledge or um, the knowledge within a company that exists within the, with the people that are working there. So a lot of our work is, uh, a lot of the work you would do is, is actually consulting, having those conversations, asking questions. And so you ask questions until, um, you know, you're blue in the face. And, and, and you know, you, maybe you have a 100 uh, slide deck uh, in, in consulting, but uh, in the field piece, it's really about coming together and pulling all of the different parties so that you have a community design, something that people can agree upon, people that can say, this is really going to unlock our community as a whole. This is going to address the women's, women's needs. This is going to address the elderly. This is going to be about the vulnerable children. You know, this is what we believe in and mm -hmm. this is what we can do. And so then a lot of our work is then is about consensus building. How do we build uh, people to be on the same page uh, and, and, and being able to commit to doing the effort? And so any of the implementation is, ultimately done by the community members themselves. We're just supporting them through some technical knowledge and, and inputs, but really driving out that work. Mm -hmm. um, a few of your comments here um, resonated, and we just got a question that could pick up really nicely from what you just said. Um, the question is, what does Sean have to do to win the confidence of the village elders and leaders? in order to meet well, but also work together with um, the communities there? Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the, the way that I win confidence with the community elders is not being there. 
<laughs> it's actually be about it's about how am I coaching and how am I mentoring community staff, so local and national staff, people from Uganda, people from these communities, and how do I help and train them to and develop them in a way that they can build this trust in the in the structures. There's just simply no way I'm going to know the dialects, the cultural nuances, and the way to move a community, the way that someone that lives there has been their entire lives and has a natural credibility because they're from so-and-so village or they know this person. And so, uh, you know, my work is really about development, pupil development, and, and then, you know, letting them take the rest. You know, I, I can't take, a coach is only as good as, as the players. And, and so it's really leveraging the talent that's already existed. The, your comment about leveraging talent that already existed really resonated with me because oftentimes the thinking is that you have to be in there, you have to be in control in order to manage a situation. But sometimes it's setting the guidance and framework, the coaching that you mentioned, and allow people to exercise their autonomy, especially within the communities that they live in, in order to make the best of the situation and provide the best recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, I want to pivot a bit <laughs> to um, some of the questions that we have that has to do with advice. Um, I would imagine there are a couple of people here that are tuning in of different walks of life, different stages in their careers in life. And one of the key questions that came up is the advice for people who are looking to create change. How do you propose that they should get started and what should they be thinking about? Well, you know, I can only speak from my own experience on this, and, and it's going to be different people, different for other people. And I think uh, today, you know, obviously we're we're a little bit, you know, we're at home, uh, and uh, we're in our local communities. And I think, I think, I think that's important to recognize the the space that we're in. I don't think we need to travel to to Uganda to to make an impact. I think. One challenge we have as, as a culture is that we are over-informed. We have a mm. lot of general knowledge. We, we know what's going on in the world, but we've got to go deep. And, and we've got to go deep in, the, in, in this knowledge set to, to really understand um, you know, the inner workings of what the concept is outside of beyond just what we're reading on the news. I think that's really important. But uh, for there to be a consistency in, in, in doing this type of work, I think it also goes deep with um, understanding your values. What's important mm -hmm. to you, uh, and and you know how does that drive the purpose of the work you're doing? You know whether you're volunteering or starting up a new project or thinking of these ideas. If if it doesn't resonate with your values and 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 a purpose, it's it's a long road, and I think you can get burnt out quite easily. And, and so. Instead of, you know, some folks will look to start their own thing, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to also plug into a community. It's, it's hard to go on your own on, and launch a project. You need to have a community, but also have folks that are already like-minded, I think is, is a real valuable opportunity to plug in, share ideas, and, and, and really build off on something. Uh, you know, it's, it's a heavy lift. And so the more, mm -hmm. more we can engage in that community and, and take that first step is, is important. I think um, leadership comes in all different ways. Uh, right. Leadership from, you know, uh, you know, picking up a piece of trash on the, on the, on the side of the road in your community or, or just being the first one to greet someone, uh, you know, especially these days, um, a distance greeting. But and just having that leadership, I think, is important uh, and something we especially mm -hmm. need right now. Mm -hmm. um, you, as we converse, it struck me that you, you had a certain vision and goal in mind as you took on this journey, which ties into one of the questions that came true. Um, how do you balance idealism and pragmatism in your work, especially when you're setting your goals not just for raising the village, but in your long-term career trajectory. Yeah, it's 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 a balance of both. I think um, you always dream big. I think that you know we we talk about big hairy goals and, and what those ambitious goals are, and, and, and you certainly and it. But then you just 
you, you kind of throw that onto the, you hit the road with that. And I think that, um, I think it's easier to get discouraged or give up on an idea than actually try to iterate it and, and, and adjust it and recognize that it's not going to be where you started. You know, Raising the Village certainly started uh, a little bit too insular, I would say, you know, mm. working in my sister's basement with these ideas and, and uh, you know, and, and drafts and, and things like that. But when it hit the road or having that, um, having an open mind of it's going to fail, but we're going to get a better version out of this. And how do we keep iterating mm -hmm. and failing until we get something that actually works and sticks? And I think, I think that's, that's where the, the ideal needs to remain. I think that the hope and the aim and the goal has to remain. But how you get there has to change. And I think that's mm -hmm. where the evolution needs to take place and where the pragmatism to say this isn't working, how, what can we do to change it? Mm -hmm. Well, the idealism that you spoke about is the stardust sprinkle that gives you hope and inspires you to move forward, but is tempered very nicely with the pragmatism in order to be realistic and to be thoughtful in how you're proceeding every step of the way. Um, we're going to go through some of the questions here that are starting to come true. Um, one question that came out is, Sean, do you have any specific causes or organizations that you volunteer in um, Hamilton or have any recommendations? Uh, you know, I think these days I, I've, I'm no longer in Hamilton, so I'm not as in touch with the community. Actually, Alyssa, you might have a better idea of that than I do. <laughs> Well, way to go, pose it back to me. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say it comes through different ways. Um, definitely going, if you're a student or if you're a recent alumni, going through the McMaster community for ideas, um, whether it's through the Student Success Center or in other avenues, is always the way to go. Um, other than that, there are other key anchor institutions in Hamilton, whether it's the Community Foundation, um, the YWCA, the YMCA, or even the local Chamber of Commerce in order to figure out what is out there to start. Yeah. Nothing would, like a Google search, as they say. <laughs> it's true, you know, and, and especially I was just reading a study on Canadian nonprofits, and one of the biggest hits is certainly there's been a financial hit it's the lack of volunteer hours. They're really suffering mm -hmm. um, from the resources. And a lot of nonprofits in Canada rely on volunteer hours to keep, keep running a lot of these programs. And, and so uh, whether it's the travel restrictions uh, at the stay-at-home orders, that's been tough. But certainly there's a lot of other gaps where the, um, within the organizations that need support right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go through some of the pre-submitted questions that we have. One of it has to do with your career decisions. What is the one thing that you regret from your career decisions? And what advice would you give to your younger self on that one? Well, I think if I was going to, I don't regret too many career decisions. Maybe I stayed a little bit too long in management consulting. <laughs> I, think, I think if I was going to give myself advice of a younger version of myself it's it's mistaking uh doing time at work for value of work mm -hmm. and and just because you put in the hours doesn't mean that you're you know you're being extra productive it's about what the value of what you're delivering so uh changing that narrative in the way that we work uh i think is important just for especially in this environment so uh, you know being able to prioritize, but also being able to know that it's the quality that's gonna, it's gonna be the more important than just putting in the hours. I think the other side I would tell myself would be uh, to do a little bit more self-care. Um, you know, I think, I think in just the, the function of the work when you're working on last mile uh, uh, development in, in rural areas, you know, uh, you know I've, I've racked up probably 20 some odd uh, vehicle accidents and um, and a lot of injuries off motorbikes and cars and, and and I didn't take care of myself I think when I first started out you know I didn't didn't take the time to recover or take the time to um, to rest and, and do a bit of that self-care and 
you know, there's, there's days now that I already feel like I've been a journeyman hockey player for the last, you know, two decades. So uh, that's something I would definitely go back in time and, 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 uh, and do over. Mm -hmm. And speaking of um, careers, another pre-submitted question that we have has to do with the most challenging moment in your career experience so far. And how do you actually deal with that challenging moment? You know, I, I think the role of raising the village is, is every day is a new adventure. Um, it really is. And, and that's, it's part of the, you know, what I love about the work so much is, is the challenges and the problems. And, 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 and so it's really, sometimes it's, the hardest decision is when there is no clear right answer. Mm. And, and, and there's an, it's an, it's a lose, lose in the sense that, um, you know, the outcome is not, you know, everybody wins, but it might be a, a situation where everybody loses, where, um, you know, uh, you know, we recently had challenges here about uh, a series of floods uh, in some of the communities we were working with. And, and, you know, they have a challenge of water, they have a challenge of, you know, sanitation. And, and you're not able to... Um, mm -hmm. You're not able to implement programs that are going to be long-lasting or effective or be able to address some of the immediate crisis that they're suffering. And so making hard decisions around uh, what you prioritize, how you stay within your mandate as an organization, mm -hmm. I think those are, those are the toughest ones. And we have a new, another new question that comes in. Um, are there other places around the world where you'd like to expand your your work, or think that your organization could make a difference? Yeah, you know, I, I think that a lot of our work right now at at raising the village is about how do we end ultra poverty uh, in the world. That's how we think, and that's how we operate. Is to say that you know, in the world, we've got about four hundred million people living below a dollar twenty five per day. Uh, it just so happens that. 80% uh, of them live in, in 14 countries. And so of those 14 mm -hmm. countries, 11 of them are in sub-Saharan Africa. And so how do we develop methods uh, that are not only um, replicable, but also scalable so we can reach more people? And so that's something that we work with. And, and we're trying to evolve the way that the development space thinks about the work uh, as well as how do we how do we accelerate the timelines in which we do it? Uh, even though we you know we hear about these valuations of companies worth you know billions or trillions, I think that the resources in the development space and development sector is quite limited and it's finite to many degrees. And so we need <clears> to <throat> find better ways to maximize those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we have another question that um, just came in, and it talks about the definition and meaning of success. What is your understanding of the definition of success as a professional? And how has your experience shaped that understanding? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, and, and so I think you know, we've got a vision, we've got a goal. Uh, of what we want to achieve, and, and that's you know from a high, you know, larger perspective, we'd love to see the end of extreme poverty. It's not easy that you know we've had uh, there's been poverty since since the beginning, and so uh, that's something that we continue to strive and uh, aim for. But at the same time, um, you know we have our annual goals that we want to hit those targets. I think that's that's. Um, you know, those are important for us to stay on, stay on track. For me personally, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's if I'm able to ask myself that I tried my best and, and I gave mm -hmm. the best effort that I had, um, you know, just my personality, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be satisfied uh, with, you know, just uh, with, with it until it's done. But I think that as well, I, I recognize, um, you know, the limitations and being satisfied with, you know, the effort that you put into something that you care about. Mm -hmm. um, 
you struck me as someone that is really grounded in how you see yourself and how you see the world around you, especially in the difficult work that you do. Well, I don't know. You'd have to ask some of the folks I work with, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, this question has to do with happiness, which is an intriguing one. What is the one useful thing that an average person could do to make their community stronger and happy? Well, I think, you know, I think that um, happiness and, and, and maybe the definition of, of joy is a little bit different. Um, you know, happiness is more of a moment. Joy is something a little bit longer, you know, something deeper and, and more inherent. And, and I think the question is really talking about this social community or a social fabric, you know, like how are we all pulling in together? Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, whoever, uh, wherever the question came from, but this, uh, that we're, there's a level of togetherness that's in that space. And I think it's, it's feeling that we're all pulling in, that we're all on the same side. There's a level of, there's a level of grace, you know, for the person that cuts, cuts you off when they're in, their, in a rush. And there's a level of, as well as kindness that exists. And I think that's, that's come to the present right now in, in, our, in our community. And I think, I think it's a little thing. I really do. I think that uh, mm -hmm. even whether it's, you know, and it, it, it's this feeling that we talk about a lot when we're in these communities, when they, uh, in many places we see a level of, when you come into a place, it's hard to visually identify, um, but it's a feeling of hopelessness. It's a whole, uh, and a feeling of uh, there's, a, there's a loss there versus mm -hmm. in some of the communities that we've partnered with for some time. There might not be that measurably be that much different visually, but there is a level of uh, optimism. There's a level of hope that exists. And I think, I think that starts with people taking the first step in, mm -hmm. in being leaders in their communities, whatever that function may be. You know, and, and, and one of the big things um, it's, it's, it's having its environment of care and then having an environment of welcoming. And, and it's a corporate, it's a corporate example, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you put, I don't know if you've heard about this test of, you know, people will actually go into a, a company and throw a sheet of paper or a crumpled piece of paper on the ground. And, mm -hmm. and this is a test to see, you know, the level of pride in that community and the level of, of how, um, you know, what is the reaction time? How do people engage in that piece? And I think, I think that's what we're looking for more now, and mm -hmm. more than ever, is that level of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question that I thought about as we were chatting, because it occurred to me, we spent a lot of time this evening talking about raising the village, talking about your work there and your reflections there. I'm, I'm curious of all the different causes that you could have choose, whether it's women's services, children and youth, um, food, insecurity, or other issues. Why, why choose to focus on this issue of ultra poverty out of many other causes? You know, I, I think it comes back to yeah, a little bit of my own personal background, um, having coming come from, you know, my family came from, were immigrants, they came from Hong Kong, uh, just the way that the structures were, uh, we didn't have a, we didn't have a lot growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was something that, um, you know, we were very aware of. Um, but what we did have was education, we had healthcare, uh, some of the great things that Canada provides, and, and what we had was opportunity and a chance. And so well, when I was, you know, when you go to these places in rural Uganda and other parts of sub-Saharan Africa that, you know, from the capital there, it takes an eight-hour drive. Mm -hmm. An eight-hour drive, you get on a motorbike, you ride for three hours, and then you get off your bike, and then you have to go on, on foot for the next hour and a half, two hours to get these places. It's the lack of opportunity. It's the lack of chance. And, mm -hmm. and they're ready. And, and they're ready to take that opportunity. And, and we, I feel as though there's, you know, we've got 400 million people in this similar kind of situation that we can have a solution to bring them together and bring them as a part of 
our society. So that's, that's a big important thing for me. And I think that even though it's far, even though there's challenges, I think that it's what you would consider, uh, for me, I would consider an easy win. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that personal reflection. Um, your experiences reminded me that there are a lot of different choices that we make as an adult or even further down the road that reflects back to our very own experiences in the past that define how we see the world and define the decisions that we make. Um, we have about eight minutes left and we've exhausted a lot of our questions and you've been so succinct and well in answering them. Um, I wonder if there are any further thoughts you'd like to share or even questions that you'd like to ask me in, in a reverse manner. Sure. You know, I, I, think, I think that, uh, I think within this space, I think that, um, and, and for uh, the folks that are joining us on, on our chat today, is, is thinking about the opportunities ahead. I think that we have uh, just uh, started to scratch the surface on uh, changing the way that we do development. I think that, that we've been able to um, tap into some new, the ways that we think about uh, technology. And you know, the reality is the development sector is a little is behind, is behind on this aspect. And, and some sub, there's a lot of expertise mm -hmm. out there, uh, folks at home, uh, and, and as with all in the corporate industry that can really push the needle forward in our work. And I think uh, for folks that are, are thinking about ways to engage, um, we need people to go deep. And we need people mm -hmm. to, to drive into their existing expertise uh, and, and be able to lend it, uh, lend it. And, and that's through, um, you know, just through volunteering as well as, you know, sharing that knowledge, I think, as well as, you know, being uh, you know, generous with these ideas. Very often, you know, we look, there's a lot of, you know, we always look to, uh, let's say, younger people to come up with the mm -hmm. solution. Um, or we say, you know, the next generation is going to handle that or solve that. Well, I think that, you know, we've got so much talent right now, especially in Canada, that could really go ahead and, and push the needle and advance the work that we're doing. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's just a, a very big gap in the way that uh, some of the processes, the methodologies that you know, we work mm -hmm. in everyday work that we could really tap into and, and, and gain from. Mm -hmm. As you were talking there, we have um, a question that came in about a success story. Um, are you able to give an example of a success story in Uganda based on your time and work there? Sure, uh, absolutely. You know, and and uh, those are my those are my favorite things. Is is the success stories are, and and for me, it's it's what the community's done. And so for these, some of the areas that we work are. Uh, remote, they're high in the mountains. You know, uh, it takes it takes it takes days to get there, and, and for mm -hmm. them, even even access um, even access the local market can take up to fourteen hours. So you'll come across uh, communities that um, you know we this one specific community we partnered with. You know, they were earning less than twenty five cents per day. The the social challenges you know, whether it was the, you know, high rates of malnutrition, it was the, uh, the lack of access to water, the, the, uh, and the inability to actually move any of their product or goods. Uh, there was just this level of frustration. And, and so when, you, when we talk about, you know, the work that's happening, you know, you, we get together as a community and we discuss what's happening there, what are the priorities that they have, and they just, you know, they identify, you know, we've got a road, we've got a challenge with the road, we can't get access to anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. As well as we've got a toilet problem. We don't, you know, nobody knows. You know, mm -hmm. We've got, we've got an, an issue that's causing quite a bit of disease. And so as a community, they started to identify, you know, what they could do to one, address uh, their, you know, sanitation issues, which was, um, 
they went out and, and set out that everyone would have their own toilet. Mm -hmm. and so for us, it's all about community initiative and how they go out and do that. And so certainly houses went out, we taught them how to teach to build those toilets. Um, but also they went out even with those that were unable to dig a pit latrine. And so they're going out and, and working as, um, you know, building in them for the elderly as well as those, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, families that were, uh, were uh, what we call vulnerable with high levels of uh, orphan children or without a primary caregiver. And, and so when they put that in place, um, as, and they, they started to say, you know what, we really got to get on this road. No one else is going to do it if we're not going to do it. <laughs> and they went out and they started to dig 10 kilometers of road out all the way okay. so that, um, all the way that, so that trucks could come in and pick up any of the goods that they had. Um, I remember the first time they asked us to drive through it. Uh, you know, certainly if the community asked you to take, take a vehicle up, you go and do it, but it was actually, uh, it wasn't wide enough. So there we are, and, and, we're, and we're all leaning, um, you know, because they don't have a car, nobody's got a car, and you're out there, and you're trying to drive up this road, and, and there you've got a wheel hanging off the side of this cliff, and, and, and the drop is 100 feet down, and you're all leaning to the right uh, to make sure you don't fall down, but you make it, and they're happy, and, and, and then you suggest they open up the road. Right. The big thing is that uh, within within 24 months, that community had gone from 25 cents a day to above three dollars per day, and they were wow. thriving. And it was it was it was because they had started to pull together and they had addressed their major issues. All we did was provide, uh, you know, shovels and hoes and some basic training, and they took the they took the rest and they really ran with it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of a better success story to end the night today. Um, it's an excellent example of partnerships, collaboration, but more so giving people the tools and capacity in order to have the autonomy and ownership to make a difference in their own way. And what you have shown there is examples on how big things could happen when different people come together and operate in a way with humility and with understanding across different cultures. So on that note, I want to say thank you for everybody for joining us today. And especially thank you, Sean, for fielding the many different questions and sharing your reflections for tonight in the work that you have done and more to come, I'm sure. Um, I hope each one of you leave the conversation tonight with ideas and insights on how you can contribute to the world they live in today, no matter how big or small. As you learn from our discussion today, reflect on your power, reflect on your gifts as well, and reflect on the privileges to have because the opportunities to create change are endless. Thank you again and have a very good evening, everyone.